this video, I'm going to give you an example of an antimicrobial resistance quantitative risk assessment. We're going to begin with the story of chickens. In the United States, we eat a lot of chicken. Here is the National Chicken Council's estimate, and they're suggesting the total chicken consumption in the United States as of 2016 is 91.4 pounds each. Well, here's another interesting little piece of data. Uh, this is a, an article that attributes foodborne illness in the United States for the decade from 98 to 2008. And when we look at the number of deaths, notice what is at the top of the list. It's poultry. Poultry is at, uh, near the top of the list in hospitalizations. Poultry is near the top of the list in the number of total illnesses. So poultry is a serious problem in the United States when it comes to foodborne illness. It turns out that Campylobacter is a particular bacteria that's commonly found on poultry. We know this, and so in the poultry industry, there are plenty of antibiotics that you can buy that you can administer to poultry. Now these antibiotics have been administered at subtherapeutic doses. That means we are not administering the antibiotics to make sick birds well, but to keep well birds from getting sick. And there are some real advantages to doing this. We're going to be speaking about fluoroquinolones in particular. It turns out that if you give chickens low doses of fluoroquinolones, it kills a lot of the Campylobacter that naturally are found in chickens. And that means fewer birds get sick. It also means that when our chicken gets to the market, it would have less Campylobacter on it. So perhaps fewer people would get sick from Campylobacter. In addition, workers who have to work among the chickens would have a healthier environment to work in. So there are some legitimate reasons for using antibiotics in chickens. There are some people, however, that would suggest that those reasons of, uh, you know, humane treatment of animals and a safer work environment for the uh, people working in the industry are not as important as the fact that with a given amount of food, a bird that takes that food and antibiotics will grow and gain more weight than a bird that just eats the food without antibiotics. So it's the weight gain side effect that many people believe is the real reason why antibiotics are used in poultry. So if we go back some years into the 1990s, in the United States, we were using fluoroquinolones in subtherapeutic doses in chickens to it kill and control Campylobacter. So the Food and Drug Administration Center for Veterinary Medicine began to review this because there was a problem that was developing and it was this. Campylobacter were seen to be increasing in their resistance to fluoroquinolones. So fluoroquinolone resistant Campylobacter were growing in numbers. And that's an unimportant problem because when people get sick, they go to the doctor if they have a foodborne illness and they are vomiting and suffering diarrhea, uh, the doctor will have to ask them for a stool sample so that they can confirm what's causing the illness. So if the people carry through with that and they are diagnosed as having campylobacteriosis, fluoroquinolones are a commonly prescribed antibiotic to wipe out the campylobacteriosis. But if the Campylobacter that are causing the illness are Campylobacter that developed a resistance to fluoroquinolones on the farm because they were exposed 
to low doses of campylobacter, uh, to low doses of fluoroquinolones, and developed a resistance, then the prescription of the fluoroquinolone drugs is not going to be effective. There was a concern that if fluoroquinolone resistance spreads through campylobacter, that it would render the drug useless in the treatment of campylobacteriosis. So the Center for Veterinary Medicine had a choice to make. They had to decide whether to allow the use of this drug in humans or not. But the difficulty was no one knew how big the problem was. So the risk assessment I'm going to show you was designed specifically to try to estimate how many people were being affected by this problem. So I'm going to show you a model here. We've got data from 1998, and we've got data from 1999. The details aren't going to be terribly important to us, but the overview would be. So I've got this model divided into sections that you can see are, are partitioned by these dark lines here. In section number one, what we try to do is to estimate the number of culture-confirmed cases that could be reported in the United States in a year. So we have them divided into non-bloody diarrhea cases and bloody diarrhea cases. And then there are invasive cases. This would be uh, when the bacteria get into the bloodstream and spread throughout the body. This depended on the number of people in the United States at the time. And at the time, there was a program called FoodNet. FoodNet is a program supported by the Centers for Disease Control. It uses these states here, provides them with some additional money so that they will report all cases of foodborne illness found in the United States. So this is just some portion of the United States. So we have good data on how many culture-confirmed cases were seen in the 10 states that report the data, but we didn't have that data for the entire United States. So we use the data from the 10 states and we blow it up or scale it up to estimate the total number of non-bloody, bloody, and invasive cases of campylobacteriosis we would see in the United States in a year. But there is uncertainty in these numbers, as there is with most numbers in risk assessment. And you can see we really don't know how many invasive cases there would be. It could be this many. It could be that many. And that's because the number of cases just varies each year because what people eat and how they prepare it and the pathogen loads on the food that they eat were all very uncertain as well. So now we have the number of culture-confirmed cases. We move on to Section 2 in our model. And Section 2 in our model recognizes that most people don't go to the doctor when they get a foodborne illness. They'll just tough it out for a day or two, figuring it was something that they ate. So we have oh, about, about 52,000 people represented here, and we'd like to know those 52,000 confirmed cases, how many total cases of campylobacteriosis do they represent? And we use some proportions here. Uh, we'll skip the details. Uh, but we use some proportions to estimate the total number of cases of campylobacteriosis in the United States in a year. And here you see 1,798,657. But, of course, that number is unknown as well. There's uncertainty there. It could be any of these. So we take a number of culture-confirmed cases and then blow that number up into a big number of total campylobacteriosis cases. Now we take that big number and we're going to whittle it back down now to the number that we're interested in, which will be down here. So once again, uh, skipping the details, we have a number of proportions here but we'll take a look at a couple of them. Uh, we have 1.46 million people who have campylobacteriosis. So the first thing we had to estimate 
was what proportion of the cases of campylobacteriosis are associated with chicken. And here it says 57.1% of these cases would be associated with chicken. And that would give us a number, 550,446 people. And then we would like to know of those, how many are from fluoroquinolone resistant campylobacter. So 11.9% of this would give us another number, the total number of fluoroquinolone resistant campylobacter, non-bloody, bloody and invasive for a total of 99,000 cases. So of these people, we ask how many of them would seek the care of a physician and how many of them would be treated with an antibiotic and how many of those people who get treated with an antibiotic would be treated with fluoroquinolones so we get down here to the bottom the total number of fluoroquinolone resistant campylobacter infections from chicken where the people seek care and get fluoroquinolones so we would assume here that there are 7,318 people a year who go to the doctor and get a drug that's going to do them no good. But of course that number is uncertain because a lot of these numbers are like this is uncertain and this is uncertain and this is uncertain. So the number of people affected would be uncertain as well. I'm going to do a simulation We'll estimate this number 10,000 times. And then we'll see how severe the problem is. <laughs> One of the problems that I'm concerned about right now is we're not seeing any results. There we go. So what we're seeing here is it's somewhere between, we're not quite finished, I've got a minimum of 1,729 people, or it could be as many as 112,000 people. So that's quite a range between 1,000 and 112,000 people. Our mean is 8,782 people. So that's quite a, quite a range. What we're going to do is hope that um, this, let me see if I can close this. Forgive me uh, for this glitch here, but we're far enough into this discussion that I would really like to be able to um, retrieve it. Okay, so this is the number of illnesses here that we have, and you can see that the problem could be small with 1,700 or it could be as much as 112,000 people. Our best guess is it's about 8,700. There's a 90% chance that it's between 4.8 thousand and 14.6 thousand. And this was the data for 1998. One of the other issues that occurred here was that there was a suspicion that this problem was getting worse. So we're going to overlay data for 1999 and you can see that's the blue distribution here and it is moving to the right. So we took this as evidence that this problem is getting worse. If I can uh, grab this, whoops. Let me try that one more time. This is thrilling video, isn't it? Okay, so the mean was 8,785 in 1998, 11,458 in 1999. And so there was evidence now of the size of the problem. The Center for Veterinary Medicine then had to make a choice, and they made one. What they basically decided was that they would withdraw the use of fluoroquinolones in poultry. This is the name of a fluoroquinolone, enrofloxacin, and that was uh, withdrawn from the market. So the U.S. no longer uses fluoroquinolones in poultry, but there are plenty of other drugs, plenty of other animals, and 
plenty of other antibiotics that are being used. So this will not be the last that you're going to hear of this antimicrobial resistance.